Thanks for joining us. Today we're here with Luke Whitlatch, um, and he's going to talk about our current exhibition of his called um, Do You Call Day Night? Uh, so without further ado, here's Luke. Hey, how are you? So I'm just going to kind of walk you around the gallery and say a few things about uh, maybe a little bit about each painting. Maybe I'll skip through a couple, but there's some good stories behind all of them. Um, all this work is new work that uh, has been made here in Asheville since I've, since I've been here over the last year. Um, each one of these paintings kind of comes from a little bit of a story or some sort of like uh, myth, folklore, legend, tall tale or something like that. Um, a lot of it is based in North Carolina and then some of it just kind of based out of my own imagination. A lot of the paintings and majority of the paintings um, are all dye, acrylic and oil on canvas and are linen. Um, the process is sort of a layered process, sort of starting with the, you know, the dyes in the background and then kind of building things up on top of that. Um, you can see that in this painting here and then also, you know, like on a larger scale here. Um, a lot of these paintings to you have titles that sort of bring them back to, uh, you know, sort of the event or the story that is the inception of the work. Um, like this painting in particular is titled, Who is this Captain and Where Do His Friends Live? Um, it's kind of a multifaceted title. It comes from a song lyric that uh, is from one of my favorite bands called The Liars, but it's kind of a reinterpretation of this idea of, I guess, sort of looking into the fact that these sort of totemic shapes take on a personality or whatever, and it's sort of like a menacing story to kind of go behind. So this next one is one of the only paintings that was not made in North Carolina. Um, this painting was actually made on a road trip from Los Angeles to Asheville as I was moving here. I had a bunch of old paintings in my car and I decided to sort of leave them along the side of the road sort of in different places and just take photographs of them almost like crime scene photos of these paintings sort of just like left by the side of the road. And so this painting is titled West to East, I left some bones for the beast. and. Um, you know, there's this old idea that, you know, as, as you go, you know, on your journey or whatever, and you plan on not going back, you'll leave a few bones for whatever's following you, you know? So it's kind of a little bit of a poetic action in that way. Um, and then, anyways, this was the painting that I painted while this road trip was happening. So this painting is the second to last painting I finished um, before the show started. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit different than the other paintings, just in the fact that it's kind of more of an anamorphous form. Um, I started thinking about, you know, these things as being sort of spiritual portraits or, you know, kind of like piles of spirituality of, you know, these sort of entities or objects or whatever that uh, exist in the woods around here. Um, but then also kind of secondly thinking about, you know, um, this, this painting is titled King of the Dust Up and it's kind of, this sort of idea that I, ha I had this friend growing up that used to fight everybody all the time and uh, you know where I grew up in Wyoming they call a fight a dust up and he was the toughest kid on the planet and so with this painting I was kind of thinking about you know what his energy would be as well as you know just kind of like coming up with a f idea of what the energy of you know a certain place in time in the forest or a certain event or just like you know kind of the fact that this guy was sketchy and how would that look, you know, if you couldn't actually use any imagery of the person. And so, I mean, aura is not the right word for it, but it's something similar to that, you know. And so um, you'll notice in quite a few of these paintings, there is some sort of kind of like portrait shaped form um, that are relating to a lot of these different energies or entities that I've been interested in. So with this series of these three smaller paintings, um, I know I talked a little bit before about some of these paintings being maybe considered to be portraits. Um, on that other side, you know, some of these paintings I consider to be abstract landscapes. Um, you know, and maybe, you know, they're the kind of this idea that this is the environment in which this portrait exists, you know, or it's just kind of like the background of something or, 
you know, an idea of it maybe being something that's actually caught in its own environment or caught in the wild. And so in this series of three paintings, you know, there's kind of like two portraits and then one that's sort of considered the idea of maybe one of these things in its natural state or whatever. Um, so this work uh, was the final work that I finished for the show. Um, I guess this painting is kind of easy to maybe talk about a little bit of my influences. Uh, I was definitely a big fan of Russian constructivist painting, um, like Mahali Naj, uh, you know, Ella Zitsky. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of like idea of, you know, the, the shapes and forms from a lot of that like Russian constructivist style painting. Um, and then on the other side of that, around the same area, you know, I was also a big fan of Kandinsky. And I know there was always kind of, I, uh, you know, this back and forth between Kandinsky and guys like Mondrian about, you know, this idea of the ordered and then, and, you know, and the completely squared off rule painting. And then, you know, a guy like Kandinsky who was, you know, just completely rooted in nature and natural forms. And I kind of always felt like some of these paintings were just like a little bit of a, you know, homage to not necessarily those two artists, but between, you know, an homage to the conflict between the two of them. Um, you know, and you can see some more of that, you know, in a painting like this where you've got some very ordered areas, you know, followed up by some pretty abstract movements. I was a big fan of abstract expressionists as well, you know, like I'm a big, big into Ellsworth Kelly and Morris Lewis, you know, and again, it's like the conflict between Ellsworth Kelly and Morris Lewis is similar to the one between Mondrian and Kandinsky. It's, you know, ordered forms over really bled out backgrounds. Um, and I think, you know, I was reading something about the psychology of seeing the other day and there was a guy that was saying, you know, that anytime you see just like a, you know, a giant expanse white page, if there's a black dot on it, that's exactly what your eye is looking for. You know, it's like this idea that you want something to be out of order or you want almost a mistake to be had for your eye to be interested in what's going on. And so a lot of times in these compositionally, I try to create these moments where you've got something that is very ordered, you know, blanked over something that you know, is maybe misordered or malinformed and to kind of create this tension and this interest for your eye to settle on certain things and also see the difference between those things. So some of these paintings also in the title refer to specific experiences that happened to me that are sort of rooted in a, you know, an idea of the supernatural or something um, peculiar that happened to me. Uh, and so this painting in particular is, is titled The Left Side of Route 50. And uh, Route 50 is what's considered to be the loneliest highway. It runs through the middle of Nevada and it has the least traffic out of any other highway in the entire United States. Um, and me and a couple of friends of mine were on a road trip there and uh, we ended up camping and in pulled into this campsite and um, it was just one, one camper in the campsite, you know, like a RV or whatever. And there was also a bunch of, uh, you know, Native American petroglyphs all around that we wanted to go check out. And um, so we ended up setting up our camp and everything. And as soon as the sun went down, this other RV just took off, you know, and there just felt like there was something eerie going on in the campsite. And, um, so we, you know, ended up making a fire and, uh, you know, going to sleep and we somehow in the middle of the night, you know, we kept hearing things, you know, kind of typical stuff. We didn't know if we were freaked out or what was going on. And uh, in the morning we woke up and there had been ash that had been spread from the fire around the, you know, the campsite and there were barefoot human footprints all around our campsite. And we didn't really talk about it. We took off. We kind of, you know, went through it the next day. But so. For me, you know, a lot of these paintings are about, you know, what is that that was there, what we, you know, what we didn't see, and how is it that I can portray that in the most dynamic manner without using anything that's too specifically visually referenced to what I thought it might be or what the thing was, you know? It's like, uh, sort of like, you know, this is an explosion of that idea of what may have been there. And so that's what, you know, a lot of these paintings are about. But this one is specifically about, you know, uh, a more kind of concise story than the others. So this painting is another 
painting that uh, you know kind of again goes back to these sort of invented or you know made up tales about the you know things that may or may not be there and this one actually is pretty close to home for me it's uh it's actually based on a photograph that i took off my back deck of my neighbor's back porch um you know being in the woods here in north carolina and there are a lot of sounds a lot of unexplained sounds and um particularly behind my house there's you know a lot of wooded area and there's a lot of unexplained sounds back there um and so in the course of time that I spent back there, I sort of started to invent this entity called the Rumble Man that exists behind my house. And um, you know, some of the ideas in enjoying a lot of these other stories are also you know, kind of rooted in the idea of inventing these stories myself and you know, taking this information and telling tall tales and you know, passing on stories of things that may or may not exist and sort of, you know, to keep the, the boat rolling for, you know, all things fantastic. And so oftentimes I'll make paintings about, you know, specific things that I've invented or specific entities that I've invented. Uh, and so this painting in particular um, is one of those. And then also, you know, kind of going back to what I was talking about before, this is sort of a hybrid painting between this idea of a portrait and a landscape. Um, you know, like this is where this entity would be in its natural state and also sort of how it affects you know the landscape and how the landscape affects the existence of it so this painting is a little different in the fact that um, it's sort of taking this idea of something and turning it into more of an object or more of something that is just completely floating within its own space um, it's almost for me this idea of taking experience and making it physical, you know? So you've got this idea of things that are really tough to explain that are kind of now branched into this physical mass. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I'll take ideas where, you know, you kind of try to sit it into a real space or something where it's like, you know, three dimensions and two dimensions become, you know, very real. And almost like to the point where, you know, like adorning something with an upside down necklace, which is, you know, sort of this fantastic idea of, you know, is this pile of smoke that doesn't make any sense actually wearing something? Or is it, you know, actually have a personality? Or, you know, what exactly, you, know, you can take a lot of different kind of physical manifestations onto an object that, you know, maybe necessarily isn't something that you would look at in that manner to begin with. So I also make drawings um, sort of in a different manner than I think a lot of people use drawing. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's used as, you know, a way to suss out ideas before you paint or something like that. Um, mostly my drawing practice exists in sort of drawing from life and then taking, you know, those original drawings from life and then just kind of putting them through this filter of the fantastic, you know, sort of inventing something that's not there out of something that's there. So. I'll go out into my yard, um, which is why this series of drawings is called Yard Life, and I'll draw, you know, a bunch of sort of graphite drawings of plants and things like that um, out in my own yard or out on hikes and stuff like that. And then I bring them back into the studio and, you know, sort of twist and manifest the forms to take on, you know, sort of like, a, you know, more of a, a personality or more of a physical presence to the plants. Um, also, you know, a little bit of a surreal existence. Um, you know, and kind of taking things and making order out of, you know, the malorder of, you know, plant life. And, and, uh, and so that's basically, you know, something that I do quite often. And, and I think in a lot of ways, these drawings do end up informing the paintings, but sometimes, you know, the paintings end up informing the drawings. And so I guess I'll, I'll use this painting to maybe address a little bit of the idea of the title of the show, which is a, a quote from Carl Jung's Red Book. Um, it's sort of a quote, uh, it's a conversation that Carl Jung is having with his own soul. And uh, you know, the, the question, do you call day night, um, is a question that his soul asks him about his entire, you know, about his existence and you know, what's real and not real. And, for me, um, these paintings sort of embody that place between day and night or that place between being awake or being asleep. Um, you know, and this, this painting is 
titled Some Speak of the Sun Like, you know, and this idea of sun like is kind of this idea of, of being fully awake, but almost, you know, a heightened awakeness where you are seeing things that aren't, you know, necessarily maybe more than what's there or a, a larger reality than what you're talking about. Um, and then in a redacted way, you know, you can think about the subconscious part of that. And so, you know, things that maybe are not necessarily there that are, you know, either in your brain or they're either part of this hyper real existence that maybe you're unaware of. And, you know, you're not just not aware of it all the time, um, even though it's existing around you.